Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan and on behalf of Musculoskeletal Australia, I'd like to warmly welcome you to our webinar this evening on the topic of surgery for joint arthritis. I'd like to begin, however, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting, the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd like to remind you about the remaining webinars <clears throat> within our list of free community webinars for 2022. We still have some great topics coming up this year with shoulder problems, complementary therapies, and the impact of musculoskeletal conditions on intimate relationships, all being covered. In addition to these scheduled webinars, we have our annual Coadlo Community Lecture coming up on Wednesday the 7th of September. This year's free online lecture will be titled Working Wise, Managing Your Musculoskeletal Conditions and Work. We have three great speakers and everyone who is currently registered for our community webinar series will be automatically registered for our Coadlo Lecture. If you haven't previously viewed Musculoskeletal Australia's website, I strongly suggest you do so. In line with our focus on empowering consumers through education and support, we have a wide range of information, videos, webinars, tools and services, including our national helpline that is available via email and phone on 1800 263 265. Our presenter for this evening is Professor Peter Chung, Peter is the Sir Hugh Devine Professor of Surgery at St Vincent's Hospital and the Head of the Department of Surgery of the Melbourne Medical School. He is also the Chair of the Bone and Soft Tissue Sarcoma Service at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and recently stepped down as Director of Orthopaedics at St Vincent's Hospital Melbourne after almost 25 years. Peter is also a past president of the Australian Orthopaedic Association. Peter has research grant funding of over $25 million for arthritis surgery research, surgery research, studying the treatment of bone tumours and advanced limb reconstruction. He has published over 450 peer-reviewed articles and leads the NHMRC Centre for Research Excellence into Total Joint Replacement. Apart from an extensive list of awards Peter has received during his professional career, we are delighted that Peter most deservedly was awarded an Order of Australia in the recent Queen, Queen's Birthday Honours List for his distinguished service to orthopaedic medicine, to research and tertiary medical education and to professional associations. We're extremely grateful to Peter for presenting this evening's webinar and without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to him. Thanks very much, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Jen, and good evening, everybody. Could I start also by paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which we're all meeting tonight? And for me, it's the, uh, uh, the members of the, the Wurundjeri um, uh, people, and I, I would like to extend to them uh, uh, my uh, respects, uh, as well as to um, uh, acknowledge that their leadership in this area has had a profound impact on the group which I lead. Um, at St Vincent's Hospital, situated in Fitzroy, that was one of the meeting grounds uh, for the Wurundjeri people. And it, we recall that every time we sit at a meeting to reflect on what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so tonight you'll hear from me about something that I do almost every day, but which over the last 30 years of practice has been heavily influenced by what my community value the most. So I would like to talk to you about the place of surgery for joint arthritis. And I've labeled it all things big and small because in reality, they're just the big joints and the small joints that orthopedic surgeons like me deal with. I'm a general orthopedic surgeon in 50% of my life and the other 50% I actually deal with bone and soft tissue tumors. The agenda I'm going to talk about tonight is pretty straightforward. I'd like to share with you what osteoarthritis is and how it affects you. Also take you through the different causes of osteoarthritis and how we investigate it. And what types of treatments are available and the strategies behind this, just to make sense of why we do what we do as surgeons and clinicians. When to have surgery and what to expect more importantly, 
And finally, without being too gory, to share with you some examples of the sorts of surgeries that I'm involved with. So the question, what is osteoarthritis? I'm often asked that. And for me, I would think, well, it's, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? It's, it's just wear and tear of a joint. But really, people don't always understand what wear and tear actually means. So I'm going to break down the word so that you understand where it comes from and what it means. The osteo refers to the bone. The ah part of it refers to joint. And the itis refers to inflammation of the soft tissue around the bone and the joint. So what osteoarthritis is, is a condition that affects the bone, the joint surface, as well as the wrapping of the capsule around the joint called inflammation. So the x-ray you see down here is what a normal knee looks like. There's the end of the thigh bone, top of the shin bone, for example. And that space in between is the joint space. And the separation of the bone is caused by the punch that sits there. Later on in life, when you, uh, for a variety of reasons, develop the osteoarthritis, this is actually what it looks like. You can see that the bone has changed its shape. The end of the thigh bone is compared to the normal. You can see the top end of the shin bone has changed its shape. And instead of the shin bone going straight down like this, it starts to sway across. So this is looking at your left knee as if you were looking at me. And you can see it's starting to bow. If you imagine the one on the other side bowing that way, you could see how John Wayne got his knees. So you see an irregularity of the joint space, a loss of symmetry of the knee, and all these extra bits and pieces poking out here. And that is typically what we would see on x-rays. And when we look in real life into knees, that's what it would look like. So you have extra bone spurs. The bone itself looks really white and dense. That's because it's hardened. There's unusual forces passing across the joint there. And so that makes it really thick and hard and compressed. And of course, the joint space itself is really narrowed. Hardly any space left in there. When you put a telescope into the knee, like an arthroscope, for example, you can see the inner lining of the wall. It should actually look like this part here, just smooth. But in fact, there are plenty of areas that look like this. And if you can imagine the wallpaper in your room getting all soaked and soggy and bubbly and ferns like soft coral growing out of it, that's what inflammation inside the joint looks like. And we refer to this sometimes as synovitis. If you did an MRI, and we don't usually do MRIs for osteoarthritic knees, but if we were to do it, you would see the inflammation and fluid looking just like this around a joint. So, so that is, in principle, what we call osteoarthritis, the bony changes, the soft tissue changes, and the inflammation around the joint. So what does it actually look like over time? If we look at this, this person here from behind, they're the hips, and the, the, the femur comes down, and then the shin bone goes straight. The ankles meet, and the knees meet. So that's, in principle, what a, a normal lower limb should look like. A pair of legs just heading down where the thighs are in contact, the knees are in contact, and the ankles are in contact. But as people get osteoarthritis and start to bow their knees, for example, at the knees, this is what they look like. They start to bow outwards, and, and hence the John Wayne look, as it were. People whose, whose ankles can touch, and sometimes the knees are well and truly spread. The other thing people complain about is a lot of swelling of the knee. And you can see this is what a normal left knee looks like. If someone's looking back at us, this is the, the knee would look, the kneecap would sit just there. It's a fairly superficial part of your joint, so it's quite prominent. And the skin is fairly smooth either side of this. But here, the definition of the kneecap is lost. And you can see a lot of swelling around the top of the knee. That space is called the suprapatellar space or the attic, I, call, I guess, above the kneecap, that gets filled with fluid. And that's what a swollen knee looks like. And when you have a very swollen knee, it gets tight and it feels like it doesn't want to bend. And when you do bend it, it increases in discomfort and it restricts the range of your flexion. So that's the impact of swelling. It hurts, it looks different, and it restricts your movement. Now, how does it present? I mean, 
typically people with osteoarthritis present at different stages. Not everyone presents the same way. But if you were to look at it and time it over, over the years of life, let's say, they will complain of a variety of things. Pain is a key feature of osteoarthritis. They also have a lot of swelling associated, like I showed you before. And because of the pain and the swelling, the deformity of the joint, the loss of, of smooth movement, it becomes very stiff. And when you put all these three things together, people lose the function of that joint. And that loss of function may be stiffness. They can't move. They can't hold without pain. It heads off at a different angle and won't allow them to use it, whether it's their arm, their shoulder, their hip, their knee, their ankle. How it starts is people might complain of a little bit of pain every now and then. Life's great, they're active, they play sport, they get the occasional injury. But every now and then they say, you know, oh, I had a strange, on Saturday I just had a lot of pain and I rested up and it was fine. And every couple of months I do something and I get this sort of rise in pain and then it comes back to normal and everything's fine. And then I do something else and it rises again and then it comes down and everything's fine. But with the progression of arthritis, and arthritis is actually a progressive condition, but it progresses at different speeds depending on who you are, the condition of your knee, what you do to your knees or your hips or other joints. But you go from episodic to mild. And what it means is you start having sustained symptoms that when you get better, it doesn't quite come back down to the baseline. It's always a little lingering something there. And that's how mild arthritis is. You have a little burst of activity, you know, have a big weekend at a barbecue, family people here, you're running around doing things, yeah, your joints ache a little bit and you feel better on Tuesday, but you know, well, although you're better, there's still a little bit of a grumbler before you get, you, you have another weekend where it, it takes a little longer for things to get better. And as things get more severe, you start getting these humps of pain and then back down again. And as you can see, when you recover from episodic pain, you're back to normal. When you have mild arthritis, you actually have periods where although you're better, you're not 100% better. But when the symptoms become moderately severe, you have these peaks and troughs, but the peaks and troughs themselves are far greater than what you would experience if, if it was episodic and mild. So most people who are really troubled by it get this uh, pain in this area. They, they have really bad days, but sometimes very good days too. They might feel the symptoms, particularly when the weather changes. You know, people say, is that an old wife's tale? Well, it's not actually, because when the weather changes, when it gets cold, when the rain's coming, when the snow's falling, the barometer drops. So the outside pressure drops. And when the outside pressure drops, all the, the blood pressure um, uh, the, the, the fluid from your, your, your vessels around the joint fill the joint with fluid. And that's when it starts to swell and you feel the pressure in your joints. And then you start to say, oh, it's starting to hurt. I, it must be bad, bad weather coming. And then when the, the weather changes, it gets warm again and improves, the barometric pressure increases. And what that does is it pushes the fluid back, in, back into your blood vessels. And as such, your joints empty. They, they go back to normal and, and you can feel the relief. When you get to severe pain, the key thing about severe pain is really quite significant. It stops you doing lots of things. So it marks swelling, you really don't want to move and you just rather just sit and not do anything. But more importantly, it's sustained. That's how I know it's severe when the pain is going all the time. That is a really key feature. It's not good and bad days, but it's all the time such that the quality of your life is impacted. And whenever we think about how we should treat someone with arthritis, we really have to focus on the impact of arthritis on that person's quality. And how we judge quality differs between all of us. For some of us, we, we are half dead before we say it's impacting us. And, and for others, it's a, a, you know, at an earlier stage. So different people will respond differently. So, what causes osteoarthritis? Well, if I had to list the top five things, the first thing is injury. So having an injury, whether it's a broken bone or a dislocation, can affect a joint momentarily. The forces that have been put through that joint or the bone to cause the original injury 
may have really tweaked that joint significantly, banged the joint together, bruised the cartilage, knocked off a bit of cartilage, creating, for example, a, a roughness that is then perpetuated through life. Other times people get osteoarthritis because it's in their makeup. For some reason, the cartilage, although looking and appearing very, very normal, is susceptible to osteoarthritis and you know families that that have a whole very strongly um, express arthritis everyone in the family's had a joint replacement has had deformities and things like that so there is actually a genetic component to it now weight can also cause osteoarthritis but not everyone you see people who carry a lot of weight who have no osteoarthritis and others do what we do know is that if you have any abnormality of the joint weight does drive the forces through that joint and that driving of the forces uh, causing unusual angulation or, or impact on the joint can lead to or perpetuate osteoarthritis. You can also get osteoarthritis as a result of inflammatory arthritis. So inflammations in the joint, chronic inflammations like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis or arthritis that children get can cause such inflammation that at the end of the day, the inflammatory process is that thing that causes the cartilage to degenerate. And as cartilage degenerates, you go through the cycle of osteoarthritis. And the final one here is a big question mark. We refer to that as idiopathic. Like all doctors, we have long names for things we don't understand. Idiopathic just means I don't understand. So an idiopathic cause means the cause that no one actually knows what of. So if you have a look at the progression of osteoarthritis, think about the surface of our joints like lino on the kitchen floor, a brand new bitumenized road, nice and smooth, and traffic goes along it. And over time, the constant movement over the exact same spot can create a little bit of wear. But perhaps a divot has come, a truck has gone through it and knocked off a piece of bitumen or by walking across the threshold of the kitchen door the whole time you wear out a little patch there and then a little flap turns up and you knock off a little bit more and extends a, a bigger crack and over time that smooth surface becomes potholed and that is actually how osteoarthritis progresses it's a constant progression simply because whether we like it or not we apply traffic over that joint what investigations work best for osteoarthritis? When you first present with symptoms of osteoarthritis, some people would get a plain x-ray, such as you see here. But really, very early osteoarthritis is a clinical diagnosis. Patients present with a little bit of pain, uh, but usually after activity, and it seems to settle, and the joint gets a bit swollen, but recovers really well. Under those circumstances, probably no reason to get a plain x-ray because it will just show a knee that looks a little bit like this. More or less normal, maybe a little bit of change here and there, but otherwise okay. Other times you might get an x-ray because the patient comes in with really bowed knees or a very knobbly joint or a joint that won't move very well and you're worried that there might be something blocking in the way that you need to explain to them to the person so that they can better understand what's going on, cope with what's going on, and then deal with what you might do to treat it. And that's when we get this, this x-ray. An x-ray that shows, we look at the, the quality of the bone, uh, whether there's thickening of the bone, new bone formation, how the joint changes, whether it's smooth or whether it's rough and deformed. All those help us to better understand what you have, how bad it is, and which part of the joints are involved. The other thing we do from time to time, and we don't always do it for osteoarthritis, is to get blood tests. And the reason why we get blood tests are twofold. One, not all arthritis is osteoarthritis. Some arthritis can be inflammatory arthritis. And if, if it's arthritis caused by inflammation, there will be other indicators in the blood of inflammation. And that's why we do the blood test. Are there any things in your blood that indicate that there's a lot of inflammation going around because the treatment of inflammatory arthritis is very different from osteoarthritis. The other thing also is 
Sometimes patients with osteoarthritis are put on anti-inflammatory medication and your GP might order a blood test just to make sure your kidneys are working well because people, uh, because um, uh, anti-inflammatory medication can sometimes affect the function of your kidneys and we just got to be sure that there's nothing there to surprise us, there's nothing going off the rails and your kidneys can, can tolerate the dosages of anti-inflammatory medication. So how do we classify the severity of osteoarthritis? There's different ways. What we know is that symptoms of osteoarthritis, whether they're mild symptoms or heavy symptoms, don't always reflect the extent of the disease. There are some people with very good x-rays that have terrible pain. There are other people with terrible x-rays that hardly feel anything. So what we know is that a patient's symptom alone is not the only way we measure the severity of osteoarthritis. One way that we try to bring some sense to it is to look at the plain x-rays. And so there was this, these two um, clinicians, Keldon and Lawrence, and they created a score based upon what the x-ray looked like. So in, in so-called uh, Keldon Lawrence grade one, they were just tiny little indications that the bones were changing. The joints remained separated more or less normally. In Kelvin Lawrence grade two, you have some narrowing of the joint. Also a little bit more of these little things called osteophytes or extra nerves of bone or spurs forming. But by and large, the joint is preserved, but there's just some narrowing there. In Kelvin Lawrence grade three, there's a, there is a significant loss of joint space. The bone is starting to thicken, and then there's also additional bone forming. In a Calvin Lawrence grade four, it usually involves the whole joint. There's almost complete loss of the joint space. Here's where the bone is bearing bone on bone, and it's bearing on it for so long, and this has had such pressure put on it that the bone changes in response to the considerable pressure. And the way it does that is by thickening up. What you'll also notice is that as you get more and more arthritis, the shape of the bone changes. It starts to swing in. It becomes a, a lot more bow-legged, for example. Or if it was on this side, you'd get more knock need. You can't change that deformity by injecting things into the knee. And often people ask me, when you get arthritis this bad, or can you just inject some cells into my knee or gene therapy or you know stem cells they may help with some level of healing of the cartilage injury but they won't change the deformity of the joint and the deformity of the joint is what also causes the forces to move through the joint in very abnormal ways that perpetuate the mechanism of damage so pain and functional impairment what could go wrong increasing in pain and reduction in the way the joint moves is also a way that we can classify the severity. It refers to what you feel and what you do or what you feel and what you can't do. So if we look at pain as mild, moderate and severe. In mild pain, it's occasionally there, you can tolerate it. Most of the time you don't need anything. As it becomes more moderate, it's more frequent. You notice that it seems to follow periods where you're doing things and you, you tend to say, well, maybe I'll take a Panadol Osteo or a bit of Nurofen, something like that. It will last a number of days and then seem to get better. When it's severe, it's really frequent. It's there all the time, stays a lot of time, doesn't take much, uh, you know, catching your toe, even on the bed sheet, sometimes tweaks the knee and you're really a lot of pain. And people find a lot of difficulty standing, getting off the toilet seat, getting out of the chair, difficulty getting in cars, climbing stairs, very, very difficult. And we know that the quality is impacted when they're even losing sleep over that, where the turning over in bed, they either wake up or in their sleep, they notice they're sort of supporting their knee or their hip joint as they turn. And I usually say that the impact on life, the quality of life in a severe um, arthritis is when people lose sleep and when you lose sleep, you get tired. When you get tired, you get punchy. And when you get punchy, people around you suffer. When, when you can't get off the toilet seat without it hurting, 
to activities of daily living. And finally, when you can't walk much distance, so you'd rather be staying home, in other words, you're housebound. So people tell me these three things, they volunteer these three things to me. And that's when I know it's really severe and impacting their quality of life. In terms of function, there's almost no functional loss if it's mild arthritis. There's some functional restriction with moderate arthritis, but with severe arthritis, it's the activities of daily living and the limitation of distance that you walk that really demonstrates how bad things are. So when you put together the plain x-rays of what we see and the pain and functional impairment, that's how clinicians like your GP, your rheumatologist, your physiotherapist, the surgeon will assess the severity of your condition and based upon that will determine what you should do to have treatment. So how do you treat osteoarthritis? Well, first thing is, and it's important to say, not all osteoarthritis need treatment. There are plenty of people out there who have osteoarthritis who don't need treatment. Why? Because one, it may not be bad enough. Two, it may not be affecting them badly enough. Three, they may not notice how bad it is because some people's activities, demands on their joints may not be sufficient to provoke the symptoms that other people might feel. So just because you have arthritis doesn't mean you need treatment. However, when we do treat people, the first symptom is usually one of pain. So that is the thing that people complain about the most. The second thing they complain about is stiffness. So how do we manage that? Well, in order to manage pain, stiffness, deformity, lack of um, uh, 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 functional ability is this thing that we call a multimodal approach. That means there's not one way of treating this. There are many ways. And it's how we juggle the different ways, whether it's tablets, or walking aids, or splints, or physiotherapy, injections. It's how those things come to play in a strategic way that helps patients with arthritis continue living very, very fulfilling lives. I often say to people, Osteoarthritis is a disease of wellness. Now that you're well, you just happen to have a gummy joint. So how do you deal with that joint and allow you to get on with your wellness? So the purpose of treatment, because you actually are well, is to maintain your mobility and independence. So we think about what the main issue is. Is it the pain? Is it the stiffness? Is it the loss of function that prevents mobility and independence? And recognizing and spending time with you to find out what's going on is how clinicians know what best to treat you with. And finally, the impact on quality of life is what determines the escalation of the care that you receive. So we are keenly aware that a patient's quality of life is what we all value. And to demonstrate value, we have to match the treatment with what the patient or the person with arthritis has. So for the treatment strategy, let's go back to, to the symptoms here. You have episodic pain, which means little blips of pain every now and then. Uh, then you have the mild pain and then moderate pain that is a lot more sustained and then severe pain. So in, in people with episodic um, arthritis, the first thing we do is say, look, you know, help it. Let's, let's, if you're a little bit overweight, let's maintain your weight, let's eat well, uh, let's exercise, let's keep moving. You know the old story, if you don't move it, you lose it. Well, keep moving. One of the best things you can do when you have arthritis is to keep moving. It's better to have a mobile arthritic joint than a stiff arthritic joint. The reason being is if it's stiff, every time you try and move it, you're wrenching it. Whereas if it's mobile, it may not move very quickly, but it moves through a range of motion that you can use. And you are less liable to wrench it because when you apply a force, the joint moves. So exercise is one of the most important things. And also watching your weight is important. What do we know about weight? Well, the, the rate of being obese in the community is about one in four people. If you look at the people who present in orthopedic clinics for joint replacement, between two thirds and 70% are obese. So we know that weight is a huge driver of arthritic symptoms. In fact, we've just done a study that showed that if you control your weight and you are able to lose significant amounts of weight, let's say 20%, 15 to 20% of your weight, we've had people 
one in three people who've undergone very careful weight control measures, one in three have elected not to have surgery because all their symptoms have gone. So we've just published that, and that highlights the importance of your personal control over your own care. So, so exercise and weight control is something that's introduced early and should be continued as you go through the phases, uh, the journey of osteoarthritis. When it's mild and a little bit more persistent, we would use gentle analgesics like Panadol. Interestingly enough, Panadol is, is an effective thing. We use Panadol after joint replacement. A couple of Panadol taken regularly is, is a good way of controlling discomfort. So simple analgesia, nothing that tickles up the heart or the lungs or the kidneys too much. We continue that uh, as the requirement goes as well. As it becomes moderate and we're dealing with not only the discomfort of the joint, but the inflammatory nature of that, we can add, for example, an anti-inflammatory. And there are a whole bunch on the, on the market uh, that you might have heard of, like Mobic, Voltara, and Celebrex. There are plenty of companies producing these anti-inflammatories, and they continue along in combination with exercise, weight control, and other simple analgesics. Also, sometimes as anti-inflammatories just lose the edge a little bit, you're not quite on top of things then, then we, you might, your, your GP might recommend an injection to the joint with a steroid. And steroid is a very local, intense uh, delivery into the joint, nowhere else, into the joint of um, cortisone, which is a steroid, and that helps extinguish the inflammation. That's why people feel better after that. And, and then uh, sometimes it gets so severe that you do all those things plus you start to rely on a walking aid. That's to share the weight. So, so a lot of the weight going through um, is spared. Finally, when you've reached the point where you just can't take it anymore and you've had enough, it's at that point that we consider surgery. So surgery is one of the treatments along the journey of people with osteoarthritis. Not everyone gets to that point, but when you do, that's some consideration but to know that there are a whole bunch of other non-surgical approaches that can be done prior to reaching that point, if you do reach that point. So when to have surgery? Well, this is surgery, like all treatments, really is for the right treatment for the right person at the right time. Doing surgery on someone who doesn't need it deprives them of the benefit of the surgery because they haven't, you actually haven't changed anything. So for example, someone with a joint that has arthritis but is perfectly capable of walking five, six, seven, eight kilometers every day, doing surgery doesn't change that. They can still walk five, six, seven, eight kilometers every day. Of course, the knee might be less knobbly, it might, it might be so bowed, but patients are more interested in the capacity to walk, do pain-free movement, maybe play a little tennis, than having a straight knee. So knowing when to apply something like surgery is really important for me. First of all, I need hardcore evidence that you've reached that point where it's the worst grade of osteoarthritis. And so I look for patients who have Kelvin Lawrence grade four changes. The other time you do surgery is when the quality of the life of the patient is so impacted, they're losing sleep, Activities of daily living are restricted because of the pain, and the distance they walk are markedly reduced such that they're now sitting at home because they just don't want to go. It hurts too much. You know, when, when you see the evidence and the patient's quality of life is impacted, then you start asking the question, are they ready? But, you know, it's interesting. If a patient comes to me and says, do you think I'm ready? They're not ready because they tell you they're ready. I don't have to convince the patient that they're ready for, for surgery. They'll come in and say, look, doctor, I don't care what you say, I've had enough. It's that painful, I just can't cope anymore. So or if a surgeon, if a patient says, should I have surgery? Nope, they will, they will do anything to get rid of the discomfort when they've reached that stage. So the other thing is, if any patient has any concerns about the surgery, the treatment, the outcomes, and it bothers them about this or that or the other, I say, you're not ready for surgery. I have to spend time to make sure they understand what's going on, what's going to happen, what the risk complications and outcomes, and they must feel happy that surgery is the right thing to do, all things considered. So, you know, surgery, although it 
it's a very useful and highly impactful treatment for patients with end-stage osteoarthritis. There are times when it should be done, other times it shouldn't be done, and we have to be very clear that we're not pushing people down that path. So let's say you've decided to have surgery. Most important thing is to make sure you ask your doctor about the procedure. Spend some time telling me about it. What, what do you do, doc? You know, what devices do you do? What is it made out of? Do you have something that you can show me? Can I play with it in my hand? What does it feel like? Another thing is, what are the risks of surgery? You know, this is all good. I'm going to get a great result. But what potentially can go wrong? What are the anesthetic options? I'd rather sleep through this. I don't want to sleep through this. How about just numbing my legs through this? And what do we do afterwards to control the pain? The other thing is about 20 to 40% of people going through joint replacement surgery have some comorbidity, meaning there's something else happening. Their heart condition, lung condition, kidney condition, high blood pressure, diabetes, that sort of stuff. They need to be checked out to make sure they're not only fit for the surgery, but fit for the anesthetic that they'll need to have to have the surgery. So that's really important. You want to ask them, how long am I going to be in hospital? What sort of rehabilitation will I have? Will I have it at home or will I need to have it in a rehabilitation center? And over the next year, what do I expect? So what can you expect? Well, the first thing is joint replacement is really, really successful. It is one of the most successful operations that humankind can have. But despite that, about one in four people who have joint replacement are unhappy. You can have the most successful joint replacement, but some people just aren't happy afterwards. And for reasons that we don't understand. So they are regarded as non-responders. And there are different things that indicate whether someone's going to be a responder or not, such as, People who are carry a lot of weight tend to be less responsive to joint replacement than people who are more normal weight. People who have a lot on their mind, depressed about things that are happening, they're concerned about lots of things, worry the day lots out of them. They tend less to respond, so we have to help them in a way to think about that. People who are not fit, who have stiff joints, they can't move it, they don't know what to do, they're weak, they don't respond as well. So there's a lot to be done before the surgery. And then after the surgery, you've got to appreciate that you're going to be uncomfortable. It's going to hurt. So you're going to need to have something done to help you. So what can go wrong? You can still have the same pain. Uh, you can get blood clots. You can get bleeding, heart attacks, strokes. You can get infections in the joint. Or the prosthesis could be designed in such a way that there's a problem. Some people don't move and they get really stiff. And then it's hard to push against that. And you can also get nerve and blood vessel injuries that can cause real problems if they were to happen. So, so if we were to just look at knee joint replacement, this is what a normal knee looks like. And this is what the arthritic knee looks like with worn out. It's starting to bow across. There's lots of joint space, extra bits of bone. If you look at the drawing, this is what normal bone surfaces look like and the potholes of, of arthritis. And after the surgery, we've put a prosthesis in that looks just like this. Beautiful, it recreates the smooth surfaces and realignment of the joint. The skin incision, people always ask me, straight down the front, sometimes it's bowed one way or the other. And surgeons have a certain preference for a variety of very good reasons why they like it that way or the other way. But you will have an incision. These incisions, as you can see here, as they mature, they get um, paler and less obvious. And many, many years down the track, it's just a fine white line. You'll have um, bandage uh, uh, dressings like this with a little thing on the side, perhaps for a drain tube that's brought out at the time of surgery. And you'll have staples to close it or sutures to close that. Five things to do after the surgery. The most important thing is take your medication. The only thing that happens to people who, who uh, don't take the medication is it hurts. Just like the only thing that ever happens to a saint is they get burnt at the stake. So take your medication. Keep moving after knee replacement. Do your straightening and bending your sides. Get back to activities of daily living. But more importantly, be kind to yourself. In other words, pace yourself. Don't go bull at a, at a gate at things, but keep doing these things. What about hip replacement? Just like the knee, the hip loses bone, loses joint space, for example. And what you find here is that you have the same amount of inflammation, and we treat it by putting a new socket in, 
and you stem down the thigh bone, which holds the ball that fits in there. That's why we call it a total hip replacement. We replace the socket and we replace the ball as well. And people are always interested which way you're taking it. There's the anterior approach, there's the superior approach, there's the lateral approach, and there's the posterior approach. The reality is they're all the same in the long run. The surgeon who does this all the time is best doing that, just like the surgeon who does this approach all the time is best doing that. And you're best doing what the surgeon does best. That's the best outcome. You just can't march up to someone and say, I demand you do it that way, because that might not be the way they do it. And surgeons sometimes try and comply and end up doing something they're not familiar with, and that in itself can bring a problem. Five things to remember after surgery to the hip. Once again, take your medication, keep moving. But unlike the knee, you don't have to push yourself so hard because moving a big leg around can be a problem. So you want to take it nice and slowly in that regard. And once again, be kind to yourself. Now, very quickly towards the end, foot conditions. People talk about bunions. Bunions mean turnip in, in French. And you have this big bow here. And the reason why you have the big bow here is this toe starts to go off in that direction. And the bone in here is called the metatarsal. It starts swaying in this direction. Rather than being straight like this, it starts bowing inwards. And as it bows inwards, it pushes this toe up. As it pushes this toe up, you get a little um, uh, corn on the top of your toe. That's called a uh, mallet toe. And so it looks like this. That's called a hammer toe. And it's a hammering on the ground here. So you get a problem up here and you get a problem down there. And so there are different ways of correcting bunions. You can use splints. You can get nighttime splints that people put on or splints that they put on like this and uh, put in their shoe. Or they can do surgery where they cut away that prominence of bone and then they straighten the toe out in different ways. You can see you cut the bone here, shift it across, and make it straight. So a, a foot like this with a bunion and, and both toes can be, end up looking like this. Correction of a hammer toe. So they're sometimes stuck in this position and the corn develops over there because it's stuck in this position. When you cut out a piece of bone, you put the ends together and you put a pin in there and it looks something like this. So a very knurled, curved toes end up looking straight. And for a period of time, you have pins with little balls on the end of it and they get pulled out at about um, the four to six week mark. What do you do after foot surgery? Once again, take your medication, but unlike the hip and knee, you want to rest. You want to elevate so it doesn't get swollen because your feet are right down the bottom. There's a huge head of pressure on it. If you don't rest your legs, you get very swollen. Uh, the wounds start to stretch. They might open and get infected. So you just want to be really, really careful. Slowly get back to activity. So people with foot surgery don't feel like doing much for the first four weeks or so. And then at about five or six weeks, your surgeon sees you back, pulls the wire out, takes off the dressings, and um, you slowly rehabilitate. So the last words here, surgery for arthritis, five things to remember. First of all, you don't have surgery unless it's indicated. So you must talk to your surgeon about whether the surgery is indicated in your particular case. You must only consider it after everything else has been tried. Thirdly, you must understand that about what is actually gonna be happening and why surgery is being indicated. So being involved in the discussion and the decision making is really important. You must match expectation and finally accept that things can go wrong, but they're less likely to go wrong if both you and your surgeon talk about what can go wrong and what you can do to minimize that. So, with that, I thank you very much for spending the last 45 minutes taking a little jaunt through osteoarthritis. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much, Peter. That was um, very interesting. I, I really, uh, your treatment strategy um, and that staged approach, I think, is very important because I think people uh, sometimes think that the the only option is is surgery, and they don't sort of really consider that more staged approach to try other probably more conservative options before getting to that point of, of really having surgery. So I think that was really sort of, you know, fantastic to step people through that. And also most importantly, to talk about those expectations um, because, you know, as you sort of said, sometimes things 
don't go quite to plan or the um, the expectations post-surgery are, are not always met. So to go through that process pre-surgery to discuss um, uh, expectations with the patient certainly uh, uh, sounds like a, a wonderful approach. Um, we've got several questions that have come through. Now, you, you talked about the foot um, just towards the end there. I have a, a question about ankle replacement surgery. Someone has asked a question in relation to the fact that um, this person uh, has, has been told that um, ankle replacement parts tend to malfunction. Um, and um, there are, you know, been fusion, ankle fusion has been mentioned. Would you, could you possibly comment about uh, where ankle replacement sort of options are at and whether there's anything um, in, improved on in the offing? Yeah, sure. So um, ankle replacement, like the hip replacement or knee replacement, so both sides are replaced. But the thing about ankle joint is it's a far more complex shape than the hip and the knee. The hip is a ball in a socket, very simple. And the knee is just two smooth surfaces just gliding one on the other. But the ankle has double curves running through it. But the ankle has double curves running through it. And trying just perfectly well is one, very difficult. And secondly, when you move the ankle joint, it moves in a very different way. So the stresses, the accidental maneuvers, etc., considerable stress on the implants. And because of that, there has been far, I guess, far results from ankle replacements over time since they were first used, dating back 20, 30 years. So people have thought, well, rather than doing an ankle replacement, why not just fuse the joint? And so for many years, and they still do it now, fusing a joint stops the movement at the joint. And if you stop the movement at your ankle joint, you should have no more pain. Therefore, most of the, um, the movement is taken further on down the leg, so underneath, by your heel, for example, by the front of your leg, for example, doing all as well as the shape of the shoe you might wear, so-called rocker bottom soles, to help you do this sort of gentle roll of the foot. So there are many things that can compensate and take up the sorts of activities that the, the ankle does after fusion. So today, uh, usually ankle replacements are done for people who are lightweight, so not much force is going through them who have low demands, for example, rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory arthritis, and, and only very certain types of osteoarthritis. They're rarely given to young people, meaning people less than the age of perhaps 65, because they're very active, they wanna do things. And if they wanna do things and they're active, they're gonna thrash that joint, it's gonna come adrift, and that would in itself create more problems. Thanks, Peter. Um, a question's come in about um, delaying um, joint replacement surgery and whether that may have any impact on the outcome of the surgery. I, I suppose there's a potential there for, for the, um, the, the wear and tear to, to sort of progress further should, um, should uh, the, the surgery be delayed beyond a time when it is probably best indicated. Yep, so, so there are certain indications here. And, uh, so, sort of certain considerations. The most important consideration is how is the disease affecting the quality of life? And I've said that before, and it is the most important thing because if it's not affecting people's quality of life, you shouldn't even be considering surgery. Now, sometimes you have to consider surgery because the the speed at which the arthritis is going is burrowing in so fast, you know that the next time they come back, it will be um, physically more difficult and therefore technically more difficult. And these are the things that if you've seen your surgeon over a number of years, they can tell you the pace at which things are going. It's unusual, but it can happen, particularly around the hip, that things start moving reasonably quickly. And a surgeon seeing you for the first time can't really put their finger on that. They need to see you a few times over a period of time to know the, the pace at which things are moving. And if it is in fact moving fast and the deformity is going to create greater difficulties for the technician, that is the surgeon, then maybe that's the time for people who are deserving of, of uh, surgery get their surgery. 
but some people say, oh, should I have surgery now because I'm fit? Well, if you're fit and you're at the right time for you to have surgery, fine. But if you're fit and you have no requirement for surgery, don't have the surgery because there is no requirement for the surgery whether you're fit or not. So really the most important thing is, first of all, we assess the need. Do you need or don't you need to have surgery? If you do need to have surgery, are you fit for surgery or not fit for surgery? If you do have a need and you are fit for surgery, is this time to have surgery? Should we rush in or not? So those are the key staged questions that must be answered. So we pick the right time to get people having the right procedure. Oh, thank you, Peter. Um, uh, well, a couple of people have asked, um, you given you've you know, understandably focused on the hip and knee principally, but would most of these sort of approaches and principles be similar, even if you're talking about sort of um, finger, finger and hand joints, any of the joints in the, in the hands or, um, you know, uh, what you sort of outline more in depth around knees would also apply to, to hip, hip arthritis from, uh, and replacements. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so say with fingers and hands. So, so the big joints, the hip, knee and shoulder, more or less, it's the same deal. The same questions need to be considered. For your feet, the small joints of the foot, the toes and all the rest of it, they, they're inside the shoe. So they in some ways act all as one. The hands are a very different thing. People can have profound deformities of the hand and yet function really, really well. And they function really well because they're so adaptable. And the reason why they're so adaptable is because we've got four fingers and a thumb on each hand. The thumb accounts for 60% of the movement or function of the hand. And so, you know, you really have two things out in front of you that can work really, really well. And as they become a little bit more arthritic, as they become a little bit more deformed, they adapt so well, such that if you do surgery to make them look better, they may not actually function better. And sometimes when you do surgery to, to fuse them into a nice looking shape, they lose the capacity to function better. And some people ironically <laughs> undergo surgery to make their hands and fingers look good, you find they can't actually do things the way they used to. So, so hand surgery uh, needs a very, very good surgeon who knows exactly what they can do and can take you through what to expect when the joint functions differently. Because as you deform, as you become more adaptable, even the tendons change position and they do different things. You know, the hands are not just like the hip or knee, they're a very special area. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, Peter, having scleroderma, does that affect um, uh, the possibility of having a joint replacement? Um, if, if someone, you mentioned some people may have comorbidities, so um, there's a question specifically in relation to scleroderma. Well, no, scleroderma in, in and of itself is part of a connective tissue condition that can have major joint problems. The issue with scleroderma is the healing of the soft tissue. The so wounds don't heal so well. They might break down. Patients might need steroids. And also their kidneys don't function so well. And those other things sometimes stop the safety or, or reduce the safety of the procedure such that we, we have to elect not to do the surgery. But yes, you can. Uh, perform joint replacement in people with scleroderma, but it should be done in a team-based approach where the surgeon and the rheumatologist and the renal physician are all talking together, planning it perfectly so that the surgery is performed at the most um, opportune and safe time for the patient. We shouldn't be taking risks from trying to manage arthritis because at the end of the day, think about it, no one ever died of arthritis. Right, So we have to take that into consideration about how do you plan a very elective um, uh, procedure for a condition that impairs function but doesn't actually kill you. So we just have to be very careful about that. Oh. Someone has asked, does the pain go away or get less after bunion or other reconstructive surgery? But again, I guess that comes down to the individual and, and post-surgery uh, expectations and so on, as you outline. You're absolutely right. So, so we find out what was the cause of the pain. Was it the arthritic joint? 
If it's the arthritic joint in the toe and you fuse the toe, that gets rid of the pain. If the pain was because there's a real prominence, a knuckle that's coming out, get rid of the knuckle. But sometimes even all that, if, if patients just simply aren't happy about their feet, sometimes no matter what you do to correct the way it looks, it doesn't help. The other thing to remember is when you change the posture, the position of one part of your toe or your foot, the other parts have to compensate and you might just start adding more stress onto the other parts. So uh, people who have foot surgery, toe surgery, also have to think about what sort of shoes they wear to now protect the reconstruction after it's been done. You know, um, it's really, really interesting that in a community that wears high heels, they're the ones that get bunions a lot. In communities where few people wear high heels, um, getting bunions and toe deformities is not so great as an incident. So, you know, our lifestyle, our fashion sense sometimes drive the, um, the conditions that we see. Mm. Uh, Peter, a question about um, PRP injections and stem cell therapy. I know PRP injections um, seem to be quite popular these days, but what's what's the evidence and the thinking around them? Yeah, look, the PRP uh, it means for um, uh, platelet-derived uh, factors or related peptides, and and what they do is they have uh, these molecules. Um, transforming growth factor beta and things like that that stimulate the healing process and what they found is that if uh, you had wounds and you treated with this, those wounds tended to heal so people thought well why not inject that into joints that are arthritic or inflamed and would help and what they found in different studies is perhaps in some cases you could get some healing but the evidence is still a bit um, slow in coming for the results that you might want to get after injecting a joint. It's an expensive way of treating it, but the you could say the jury is still out as to whether it really has a huge impact in joint arthritis or not. It has been shown in studies that if you inject it, for example, in injured tendons, that there is a healing process. It stimulates a healing process. Now, in terms of stem cell therapy, uh, there are lots of people trying to use stem cells and in fact i run a group of people looking at uh, a research group looking at the role of stem cells in preventing the development of arthritis by repairing injured cartilage it's not widely available it's not widely used it's not conventional treatment and so people at this stage should not be expecting stem cell therapy to be a main opportunity for them. And if anyone says, oh, there's a clinic down the road that gives me stem cell injections, they should be wholly aware of, be careful of that, because the evidence at this moment in time is that it may have some value, but we haven't fully understood how it can be used purposefully. And therefore, patients don't know if they're actually going to get any value out of it. Hmm. And, and Peter, um, uh, is there, does age enter into considerations for, for surgery, um, knee or hip or any, any sort of uh, joint, joint surgery as for yeah. a person's age? Yeah, we, well, the most important thing is people arrive at the age for joint replacement surgery when they're usually in their 60s, 70s and 80s. So it is, a, it is an operation of the uh, middle, elderly, middle-aged, um, age group and what allows them to have the surgery actually is the anesthetic so anesthetics have become safer our care of the patient before surgery has become far more acute um, and patients are delivered into the operating room in a much better state than they were many many years ago and because of that patients are having surgery a lot older the other thing as well is that we have a very very healthy society we're living into our 90s now and you know our, our, our kids grandkids will see people in their hundreds and it won't be a problem so you know the joint replacement registry shows that there are more people now undergoing joint replacement in their 90s than before so that indicates to us it's a safe operation if conducted on a patient who's deemed to be safe for the surgery and the anesthetic and that's where uh, uh, people should be really careful about asking the surgeon 
tell me about the checkup I'm going to have before surgery. Have we looked after all the issues that could be a problem afterwards? Mm. We're, we're just right on eight o'clock or even a tick after. Just a, a rough guideline, Peter. Um, a couple of questions with regards to how long a knee replacement might last. But I guess that depends on a couple of factors. It depends on a couple of factors, but in general, 95% of joint replacements are the same one in 15 years after surgery. So the majority of right. people get to about 15 years and a very large proportion of those will continue on for 20 years. Right, great. Well, that's a positive note. Um, and on that positive note, we will uh, say thank you very much again, Peter. We've been very lucky to have you present this evening. Uh, there's been a lot of interest and I'm sure the recording of this webinar, as I said earlier, everyone, it will be available on our website freely. Uh, you can watch it as many times as you like. So I'm sure it will be viewed many times as people um, think about their different options uh, and learn certainly learn about the earlier approaches uh, rather than even just jumping to the idea of surgery to begin with. Um, so Peter, look, thank you so much for giving your time, energy and expertise this evening. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining with us this evening. Uh, make sure you tune in to our next webinar, which will actually be on common shoulder problems on uh, the 9th of August. Um, so on that note, I thank you all for joining and bid you all, uh, all a very good night. Thank you.